Thank you so much. Um, I am delighted to be back uh, at Oakville Green. I did a presentation earlier uh, uh, for its AGM, and I am happy to see my Oakville Green friends and anybody else that's here today uh, on this sort of gray and snowy, uh, too warm January day. Uh, <laughs> I uh, 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 would like to, uh, we've got a lot to talk about this morning. I'm going to, uh, it's going to be action packed. It's going to be crammed in. There's going to be lots of information here, but uh, um, as Daniela said, that it, this will be recorded. Um, I also have handouts at the end. So there's a link for handouts. Uh, and um, I'm delighted to stay and answer questions. Uh, we are, our email is info at bloomingboulevards.org. So if you think of a question afterwards, feel free to email, email that goes right to me and I'm good at getting back to people. Okay, without further ado, I will share my screen and we'll launch into it. There we go. So what we do uh, is we uh, at Blooming Boulevards raise awareness, teach about native plants, uh, we uh, grow our native plants, and we help people to um, to to grow them, provide help. Let me get rid of this uh, these pictures if I can. How do I do that? Here we are. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, but especially what we're doing with Blooming Boulevards, our whole organization is all about, not only about education, but it's about building habitat networks. So we used to call our projects pollinator gardens, but much more than that, they are uh, ecological communities, habitat, year-round habitat, not just for pollinators, but for all the plants and other insects uh, and wildlife that support our pollinators. Uh, so I now am of the mind that we should be calling our pollinator gardens habitat gardens. And um, in particular, they are useful uh, to address fragmentation when we build networks of these gardens so that the wildlife can fly back and forth, especially wildlife with limited ranges uh, through our network gardens and reach our larger patches of habitat. So that's what we're doing in Mississauga uh, with our Boulevard Garden Program. We connect neighborhoods to nature. So this is raising awareness that we're all about connections. Native plants for tough sites. Um, and that was, uh, this is a great topic because um, people uh, you know, nothing much grows. Some people struggle trying to grow horticultural plants or trying to grow grass, even trying to grow native plants if you are have not chosen the right uh, plant for the right site. So we're going to be talking a bit about balconies and rooftops uh, under trees. And of course, we've got shade under trees. We've got dried out soil. We've got roots. Um, hillsides with all the slope and uh, prone to erosion. Uh, we have sand and gravel where the water just goes right through and the soil is very low of nutrient. Uh, and we have salt conditions. Um, and I could go on, if this was a two hour long talk, I would be talking about uh, wet sites, um, shorelines, uh, 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 marshy areas and various things like that, but we just don't have time to cover everything. There's lots and lots of different ways that you can address tough sites. Okay, so I've zeroed in on these. And uh, the first is um, to talk about why plants are so important to us. Anyway, wonderful ecologist, naturalist, naturalist uh, Edmund, Edmund O. Wilson, said in 1984 that biophilia, he coined the word biophilia, which is an instinctive bond between human beings and other living systems. And that includes both fauna and flora, which is why it means so much to us to be able to care for the land and what's living on it. Um, but so biophilic design is a sustainable design strategy and architecture 
uh, that an architecture that incorporates reconnecting people with the natural environment. And this is a movement that's happening all over the world. So particularly in urban areas, we're interested in growing um, natural environments in hostile spaces, which is really what we have the most of in uh, an area that's paved. Uh, and we are in a point where all along the Northern Great Lakes regions and the heavily urbanized, especially Southwestern shoreline of Lake Ontario, uh, we have uh, an increasingly paved environment. And so as an, uh, climate change advances, we uh, and, in, and species start moving, well, they have begun to move north. They encountered this wall of urban uh, environment with rooftops, with paved areas, and with ever shrinking uh, green spaces. And so that's why it's it's important to think about, okay, so people with yards, people with boulevards, the wasted spaces that we have in our few remaining fields and meadows. And then we've got this whole uh, arena, this beautiful surface, uh, which are our balconies and rooftops. So why not make habitat there, okay? And you can see, and this rooftop garden is absolutely beautiful. This is entirely native plants, uh, hardy, suited to this environment. Uh, so let's find out how to do it. Okay. Now the plants that we choose are plants that um, that naturally grow in these environments. And you, if you've ever been to Kelso Conservation Area uh, on the Niagara Escarpment, you will see cliff dwelling, limestone clinging uh, native plants that grow quite well in this environment. So we look for escarpment type of plants uh, that will that uh, uh, can inspire us. And this is our urban equivalent of the Niagara escarpment uh, here. And of course, this is happening all over the world and high rise towers. Uh, and so this is called the, the vertical forest, the Bosco Verticale in Milan in Italy. And um, it has, uh, there's twin towers, steel reinforced. It was built specifically to house plants. Um, the steel reinforced balconies contain more than 800 trees and 14,000 plants. Uh, it nurtures over 20 bird species, of course, and all of the insects and other creatures that support these plants. So this is inspiring. Um, and so what we wanna do when we're uh, gardening on our balcony or our rooftops is choose the plants that are suitable, but we want to be able to relate to the spaces around us too. Um, and that is that has to do with whatever uh, hard, furniture that you are building and the, the fencing, uh, but also you need to think about the orientation and choose your plants very carefully to complement those things. Okay, uh, and of course, um, there's a lot of projects that involve growing vegetables too. So our vegetable, our urban farming projects can also inspire our native plant gardens, just the techniques that are be have been used to grow these vegetables. Now, most of the vegetables are annuals and they are do quite often do not have the deep roots that our uh, native plants have. So the containers could be different, but there are lessons to be learned here. Um, and this is worth investigating. Uh, this is University of Toronto, uh, the Galbraith Building Rooftop Farm. There's also another rooftop on, at, uh, the uh, Metro, Metro University here in Toronto and uh, increasing office buildings, office towers have vegetable gardens. So this is a Euclid Avenue house in Toronto, uh, architects Levitt Goodman. And you can see that uh, these aren't necessarily all natives, but there's a great deal of uh, the preponderance is native plants. 
and uh, the garden are rooftops and balconies at different levels. Um, the plants are different sizes, different degrees of shade tolerance. Uh, those on the top that gets the most sun or the low growing ground covers. And you can see that um, if you can see there's grasses and there are also succulent type leaf plants like sedums. Um, I believe that there's some times in here uh, there are, uh, but particularly the tough prairie grasses that don't need a lot of water. On the lower levels, there are more shade tolerant plants and um, they're more accessible uh, to people who can get out there, uh, turn on the hose or the watering system and um, uh, with an eye to beauty and what you see your landscape when you're looking out the window. So just different techniques, okay? So considerations, site conditions such as sun and wind exposure need to be taken in terms of when you're uh, choosing your plants and take in the size of the mature plant so that you can calculate the amount of space you have and also the amount of water that you're going to need. Uh, mature plants can shelter your, your um, larger mature plants. The bigger plants can shelter your smaller ones. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes that so they can be positioned uh, so that they function as uh, windbreaks themselves. And of course, the size of the container is depends on how uh, it's quite heavy, the larger size container. So you've got to make sure that your roof can accommodate that weight. And uh, also, if you're using native plants, the perennial native plants, or possibly some smaller shrubs, then you need to think about their seasonal interest and what they're going to look like during the different seasons if you are making or designing a garden space. Uh, and so um, these are different approaches to uh, the look of a native plant garden. You can have something that's structured very formally, uh, integrated with the seating so that you can sit out there in your balcony or your rooftop and enjoy your plants or enjoy it from the window. And uh, some of the challenges are, of course, the time that you have to maintain your garden. Uh, you want to choose a wide variety, not just several different kinds, but you want to vary your plants as much as possible for um, extended season of bloom. And you want to have things in bloom all uh, throughout the summer. So generally you try for uh, two or three species in bloom at any given time from uh, May until hopefully October or so. Uh, and that means you're going to be using quite a number of species, at least 10, 12, a dozen species of plants. Um, you want to choose your containers carefully. We'll talk about that in a minute. And you're going to plant in soilless mix, mix and fertilize. Uh, not in soil because the soil is hard and it compacts down and uh, so the soilless mix stays light and uh, much more uh, conducive to root formation. Then, but of course, soilless mix um, is not, it does not have any uh, fertility. So that's why you have to fertilize quite your garden. Uh, continue your, uh, consider your, and the maintenance needs uh, is depending on are you going to be around all summer? Who's going to water? Who's going to care for your garden? Who's going to weed? Uh, and that means that you choose plants that aren't, that perhaps are drought tolerant if you're somebody that takes off for several weeks during the summertime. Uh, choose plants that are uh, 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 not susceptible, that can grow quickly or that can grow more aggressively and they can crowd out weeds fairly quickly. Uh, but then you, they all have to be, your garden will have to be maintained by removing some of those more aggressive plants if they really become thuggish. <laughs> okay, so there's all these things. Don't forget, you know, it's a low maintenance garden, but it's not a no maintenance garden. It's a garden and gardens need to be maintained. But all of this will determine your choice of plants. You have many options. So for containers, you uh, the container size and materials 
Oh, how they are proportioned will matter if you are overwintering, particularly if you're overwintering your plants out, outside. So this is a container garden um, that uh, was uh, uh, part of the Royal Horticultural Society display. Uh, and uh, if you go to Canada Blooms, you'll see container gardens. Uh, look on time uh, online and you'll see container gardens. Well, people have, um, you can consider a raised bed, a modified type of container garden as well. And this particular one was made out of um, uh, roofing material. It's metal. Um, you could use fiberglass panels, panels as well. Is this attractive? Yes, it's very well designed. Is it going to work for plants over the winter? Um, maybe with modifications. So if you use flexible plastic and fiberglass, it's lightweight, it's inexpensive, and it's versatile. If it's metal, it's very poorly insulated. That's the problem with metal. Uh, it, in the sun, your roots will cook and the cold, freezing cold, they will freeze. So you're gonna need insulation if this is if these are metal panels that are that have been bent, you'll need some type of insulation between the metal and the root uh, and the root system. Uh, wooden materials for containers are very good uh, insulating materials. Uh, you want to use rot resistant cedar uh, or pine treated with a, some type of preservative, but then you're going to have a, a barrier between the wood and your plant roots uh, so as not to damage the roots. Um, <clears throat> polyurethane foam planters are lightweight. Um, they resist chipping and cracking. They insulate the roots. And they are uh, really the most highly recommended for plants that say, uh, stay outdoors. So this is an example of um, problematic plants for outdoors. They're very attractive, earthen wear containers and note that these are most often used in warm countries uh, where or warm climates if they are going to be outdoors all season. And um, through the winter, if you have earthenware or even glazed ceramic containers, uh, these are unglazed, but any type of ceramic container will not flex um, if it is containing something that has water in it, the uh, soil or soilless mix with that has that's moist will freeze and expand and crack the container. So it needs to be protected uh, from freezing. So potting soil, um, and the reason we stay away from soil per se uh, is that soil compacts over time and the roots can't breathe. It turns into this very hard, uh, impermeable, uh, the water runs off, it doesn't, it's, it's not porous. And it um, over time, and of course we're talking about native plants that are perennial plants, uh, this is not a good choice for potting, a uh, potting medium, okay? So we use a soilless potting mix and that is mostly uh, it's a mixture of sand and some kind of fibrous material. And we can choose from peat or coir. Uh, we can choose, and there's other materials that are that people can choose too. Um, we use some type of an organic substrate, leaf mold or leaf mix or compost. Um, this says uh, use a coir based mix and avoid peat, which quickly breaks down into CO2 and water. Um, I like peat, but I also then add vermiculite um, and perlite, and that helps to uh, maintain the, the openness of the soil. And then what I do is just uh, add compost regularly, and peat works for me. But if you prefer coir, um, that's fine too. Coir is very good. And for those who are familiar with coir, it is uh, the offshoot, it's coconut fiber. Um, ecologically, the use of peat and coir 
probably Pete is um, more um, environmentally friendly in Ontario or in, in Canada because we have peatlands here um, and we don't involve a lot of carbon producing shipping uh, cost, uh, the cost, high cost in carbon. Um, whereas Quar is from uh, on the other side of the planet and harvesting and shipping is uh, very costly in terms of carbon production and um, in terms of the environment and environmental damage. So it's a toss up one or the other. Of course, peat is not renewable and Quar is, and we're not going to get any further into that discussion. It's arguable and the jury is out and you need to. But I personally um, am, am one who uses peat-based potting soilless mix. So um, you can decide what you want to do. Use real dirt, okay? Any kind of soil, real actual soil uh, in a flower pot only if the pot will be holding an aquatic plant. Fertilizer, soilless potting mix uh, contains few nutrients. So um, you're, you're going to have a, a stressed plants that aren't going to have the nutritional, their nutritional needs met unless you fertilize them. And you can use chemical fertilizers. Of course, all fertilizers are chemicals. Um, even organic fertilizers break down into their chemical components before the roots can use them. So chemical fertilizers are okay uh, in contain when you're talking about container gardens. I would not use just chemical fertilizers in an in-ground garden because fertilizers actually um, uh, uh, only feed plant roots. They don't do anything to enhance the soil health and well-being. Um, so in a container, we're not interested in soil health and well-being. In an in-ground garden, we want to encourage the microbiota, okay, in the soil. And we want a whole, want to nourish the whole and preserve and conserve the whole soil biome. Uh, and of course, there's a world of wildlife um, in the soil. So uh, organic materials and organic fertilizers are really uh, to be encouraged if you're gardening in uh, in your backyard or your front yard or along your butter boulevard in garden. In a container, uh, it's the soilless mix and a chemical fertilizer. And they're safe, follow the instructions, uh, but too much pollen fertilizer, kill a plant, you'll burn the plant if you overdo it. And say, my plant's not doing well, I think I'll fertilize it some more. No, the opposite is true. So for mulch, of course, this is something that is very useful for hot, dry places where your soil surface is going to dry out very quickly, uh, especially if it's windy up there on your rooftop or on your balcony. And mulch will help your plant, uh, the soil surface stay cool and your soil surface uh, from drying out, keep it from drying out too quickly. And, um, and so you've got a variety of different materials you could use. Uh, anything that will cover the soil will do. Um, something that breaks down, if it's an organic substance like uh, leaves or bark, it, or it's fine. And something that's just purely decorated, decorative that doesn't break down like gravel and decorative glass or uh, marbles or pebbles or anything like that are also fine. Uh, so this retains, it cools the soil, it retains moisture, it looks good, uh, and just a thin layer is fine. You're not needing the mulch so much to control weeds. You're not going to have the weed seeds that make it up there uh, quite as much as an in-ground garden. Um, for water, you want to group, if you've got a number of different containers up there on your rooftop or your balcony, uh, the best um, advice I can give you is to cluster those containers together uh, and um, choose plants that have the similar watering needs. So you don't want to put your cactus in with your woodland or wetland plants. You want to put all the dry, um, the plants that are drought tolerant together, and you want to put all the 
shade and needing of more moisture plants in a different grouping so that you can water them as a group because watering takes a lot of time on a balcony or a rooftop garden. That's where you're going to put your most energy. Monitor them. Um, they dry out much quicker uh, than an in-ground garden. And sometimes you can have a little self-watering system set up with wicks and timers. Um, a lot of people prefer to do this, particularly if you're if you're going away and you don't have, you know, you can't attend to your plants every day. Use large deep containers too, uh, which will uh, help the plant contend with drought. And I love this rooftop garden. It's so eccentric and uh, interesting. The containers are inventive, very sculptural. Um, and this is where your imagination comes in handy. You can put uh, found objects to use in your garden. Uh, use your potting soil, you know, your soilless mix, uh, mix it with vermiculite and either peat or particularly coir. Uh, mulch your soil surface again, and then you choose your species adapted to a uh, beach. Okay, anything that's dry, an alvar, which we'll talk about later, and your dry prairie sites. I've got lists in my handouts um, that you can use to access those uh, the types of plants that do well in environments like this. Uh, there are, uh, are in this uh, plant uh, grouping, you can see silvery leaf plants, and that's a clue to plants that are well adapted to drought. Those little, the fur, the little uh, that makes gives a silvery, silvery look on the leaves of your plants, help the wind glide right over the leaf surface without drying it out. So for wind, wind breaks are good, um, or can be used. Uh, they can come by hanging furniture or blocking the wind in, with lattices or some type of webbing. Netting will help block wind. Um, the placement of those pieces, of those items, uh, consider the placement so that they are strategic, uh, so that they can protect the plants. And um, you want to, if you've got hanging plants, you're going to want to secure them in some way with a chain or some kind of um, rigid structure so that they're not going to uh, bat, bash themselves and swing wildly in a windstorm. Uh, move plants away from railings, which are usually more susceptible to wind. And then plant in layers, like you see in this, uh, this box, this raised bed here, where you have your tall plants protecting your lower plant. For winterizing, use your deep um, containers. It's best if they're frost proof. So ceramic containers you'll need special or not frost proof, like I mentioned. Um, they'll need special pr protection. Um, you can wrap them with an insulating material and um, some kind of an insulating blanket. You can uh, put uh, cages around them filled with leaves, uh, whatever works for you. And um, if you've got a window or a sliding door that's looking out onto your balcony, you're going to be seeing these all winter. So, you know, for this, um, and that's why I included this slide, it's not too bad looking, it looks okay. <laughs> uh, it's not like having bales of hay piled up around your plants uh, and, uh, and, and it works very well. So leave your dead stem standing until weather warms in spring. And of course the insects will overwinter in dead stems that are hollowed out or pithy. Um, and uh, and you can see how these plants have been wrapped um, and put against the side of the house, which is a bit warmer, you're getting some uh, radiant heat from the walls um, shoved under the table. Uh, if pushed together, they're protecting each other. You know, those are different techniques you can use. So long-term maintenance, keep in mind the ideal conditions for the plant for so what plants do you have? What are their ideal conditions? You're going to need to maintain pH. So what will happen is plants, as the salts build up from your fertilizers, 
and watering uh, over the years, okay, over those months of watering, over the years of watering, your plants, there's a buildup of those salts and minerals in the soil, and this will burn your leaves. Uh, even though you're not salting your, you know, any ice on your balcony or rooftop or patio, okay, it's the actual watering of the plant, maintaining a plant that builds up, results in buildup of salt. So your plant, especially those big ones in containers that you can't just empty out and refresh the potting soil, um, you flush the salt away, okay? So you every few years, I would say every other year, every two or to three years, flush the soil with water, uh, flush it well, run water into that pot for half an hour or so and flush out those extra salts and minerals. Okay, here's some examples of planted container gardens planted with natives. Um, and just so that you can see the look. Now you can plant um, according to the insects you want to attract. You can plant according to uh, the design, the colors that you want. You can plant according to the, the design of the pot. Uh, there, you have different choices, just like you do in a regular in-ground landscape. And here are, is an example of some of the plants that you could use. So anise hyssop is a very good container plant and with that will withstand drought. It's a sun plant. Uh, Black-eyed Susans um, and Coryopsis as well. Not all of these in this photograph are native. Um, the, uh, the various grasses. Uh, so here's a little compendium here. Prairie smoke is great. That's an Elvar plant. Lens leaf coreopsis, nodding onions are great, They're small golden alexanders, um, hairy beard tongue, and butterfly weed all will withstand heat and drought and will bloom for a long time. Um, they bloom at different periods throughout the year. And I would include a goldenrod and an aster in this for fall. Uh, so here's the grasses, hoary vervain, not blue vervain, but hoary vervain, yeah, hot and dry. Pennsylvania sedge will, is a nice filler plant, heath aster, um, and also upland white aster, I should add, are good for containers. Okay, so those are on the handout list. Under trees. So gardening under trees poses its own challenges. Um, here we have in Toronto and the GTA, the Eastern Deciduous Forest Biome. Uh, this is a the, called the Carolinian forest. Uh, it's one of the world's richest temperate woodland ecosystems. There are many, 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 many plants that thrive in the shade of canopy trees. And, uh, and why do people still plant only hostas? Um, <laughs> mixed plant community of wildflowers, grasses, small shrubs, juvenile mature canopy trees are typical of our Ontario landscapes before settlement, and we're we can't get that back, but it uh, it doesn't it's not unlike what many people's front yards look like. Okay, um, now these are savanna plants. If you just go to High Park, you'll see a beautiful example of a uh, black oak savanna, and um, what we can do is choose plants that will. Uh, do well in those same conditions for our woodland or our uh, dry shade gardens. Um, and, or if you have shade garden that is not so dry, you have more options. Um, generally, typically in a shade garden in a woodland, you're going to have tiers, uh, layers of plants. So you'll have a tall canopy, you'll have a lower canopy of woody plants, and then you'll have um, a an under layer of the woodland perennials, and then finally you'll have your ground covers and your non-flowering plants like the ferns and mosses. Um, typically, people uh, gravitate. You go to garden center and you say you have shade, and so they're going to point you to the hosta hosta area. 
Uh, and so people will be planting hostas and ferns and not much else, maybe some hydrangeas for shops, shrubs. But you have um, that, then you end up with a monoculture, just like lawn, uh, and you drive through a neighborhood and you look at everybody's gardens underneath the trees and you'll see hostas. Uh, so we want to try and do something different. And, um, and so that you're going to support biodiversity. In this photograph, you see ostrich fern, uh, you see um, a colt's foot, you see columbine, uh, you see a, a variety of small bulbs. I'm not sure what everything is here. Um, you see woodland poppy that's not blooming. Okay, you see lots of plants in here. So there's uh, um, our sedges first, or, or your great matrix plant. Those are those ones that fill in the spaces. And a great uh, sedge for dry areas that will withstand both sun and shade is called Pennsylvania or oak sedge. Uh, there's another one called ivory sedge as well that are available here in Ontario native plant nurseries. Um, you're going to choose uh, some flowering bulbs like a trout lily. Uh, which are uh, adapted to dry shade. And of course, your trilliums, which prefer some uh, a little bit moister area. Uh, your red, these are um, a combination of red trilliums and spotted geraniums, which makes a nice duo in a shade garden um, mixed together with ferns. Uh, but geranium maculatum, the native geranium, is a great ground cover for a shade garden. So if you've got a tree, for example, a Norway maple, it might look like this underneath your tree, especially if you've been trying to plant some grass. And um, what do you do? And that's very often because people scoop up their the leaves that fall from the tree, don't allow them to just uh, decay naturally and enrich the soil. Um, how is the soil going to retain its health with those greedy roots that are right below the surface and the tree, large, thick canopy, which uh, keeps it dry underneath when it rains. And it's so shady, uh, the light doesn't filter through those leaves uh, that uh, not very many plants will actually will thrive down there, um, hence the hostas. And so what do you do underneath a Norway maple? Well, first you start with the soil. So you need to allow your fallen leaves to remain in place. You can enrich it with leaf compost. It's called leaf mold, uh, where you gather up your leaves and let them rot, and then you sprinkle the leaf mold all around. You uh, remove any grass that exists uh, by very lightly scalping the soil. Uh, I wouldn't smother or you will affect the roots of the tree. Uh, very lightly scalping or hoeing. Um, and uh, and then you're going to add organic materials like compost, like meat, leaf mold that I mentioned, or very well-aged natural hardwood bark. Um, it, you can aerate the soil, uh, but uh, gradually the earthworms will work on that if you have applied compost. And this will take several years. Meanwhile, what you do is you carefully move, remove that competing grass if it's there very shallowly. Uh, try and get those that grass out. Uh, don't dig down deeply or you'll damage the tree. Um, dig holes with a trowel so you can that way you can see where you are uh, any roots that are there. You try not to nick or scrape any any of the larger roots and mulch no deeper than do, do your planting. Uh, plant small plants, little plugs, um, mulch no deeper than three inches, okay? That's about six to eight centimeters and keep it watered until your plant's established. So you are gonna try, um, put in ground covers and some very small shrubs in here when you're first establishing your garden under trees. And then you can move on from there as your soil gets improves. And this is the walk. Uh, so I would uh, use a matrix of sedges and then some native ground covers. Um, by all means, if you're mulching, uh, avoid a mulch volcano around your tree. So that's 
that's um, very harmful for the bark. Uh, it's mother's roots. It's not good. You see this all the time. And <clears throat> you know, see uh, the diagram of the reach of the roots? Uh, that is typical. It goes way beyond, way further out than um, double, triple the distance from your leaf canopy. You've got a tree in your front yard, chances are its roots will extend all over your whole front yard under the ground. So if you've got a black walnut, something that injects a um, uh, toxic substance into the soil and that ex exudes from the black walnut roots, uh, it's called juglone for black walnuts. Uh, black cherries also are, have a toxic substance. Allelopathic, it's called allelopathy. Um, and that, it does that so that uh, it, it reduces competition. Clever thing that it is, okay? But most native woodland plants are ecological companions. Many, many of them, not most, I would say, to black walnut. Okay, there's a whole black walnut ecosystem and it, it, it works together with plants that will tolerate juglone. So there are lists of plants that tolerate juglone. Be aware of that, not all plants do. Um, viburnums, for example, I planted a viburnum near my black walnut and right away it died, okay? Uh, death to many vegetables that are not native. Uh, um, so if you've got tomatoes anywhere near a black walnut, <laughs> they're not going to be happy. Okay. And uh, uh, a newly planted mix of understory trees, shrubs, and herbaceous perennials. This, this is what uh, a garden can look like. Um, and you can see that these plants are thriving. They're going to be doing quite well. Some suggested plants, wild columbine, bloodroot, um, the false Solomon seal, a uh, spotted geranium, which is geranium maculatum, okay, wild ginger, the acerum candens, uh, and white wood aster. I also like the big leaf wood aster. Uh, this is the Eurybia dubricula, divericata. Uh, for uh, a uh, purple flowering raspberry does beautifully, beautifully in dry shade. It does appreciate some sun. So a dappled shade is nice. Honey locusts are great for flowering raspberry, for example. Christmas fern, um, uh, which stays evergreen all winter. And bottle brush grass also in dry shade. Spice bush are nice shrubs, native shrubs for uh, woodland edges in particular, and they will bloom in the, um, they, they make yellow blooms in early spring, uh, almost it's like a native forsythia look. And then at the three season interest, they make beautiful berries in the fall. Uh, the leaves turn bright yellow. And okay, so slopes, slopes. Um, we have slope gardens and you can see these people Installing plants on a slope. Now, the takeaway from this is that they're using drills. Um, these are like uh, mixing drills, not a household drill, like a great big augers, but they are a lot easier if you're trying to balance on a slope and you don't want to be on your hands and knees. Okay. Um, and if, particularly if you've got a lot of plants to put in to install, these mixing drills with their augers are a uh, uh, a real boon. The plants uh, to establish quickly are larger. So they've got larger root balls. They tend not to wash away like a smaller seedling would. It gets to be expensive. So that's why growing your own is helpful. Uh, but there's other techniques you can use as well. This slope is uh, entirely native plants and it is um, the, you've got pathways here. It, it is terraced, you can see, because it's quite a steep slope, slope. So terracing is another technique that you could use. Um, so how to terrace a slope, there are different methods. This slope has been um, protected from eroding uh, with uh, filled sandbags staked in. And then the um, it, it, until while the roots are growing, it blocks the the downward flow caused by rain hitting the bare soil. Uh, it's also mulched um, to protect the soil from 
uh, to break the power the you know, the power of erosion. And what I encourage on a slope is uh, adding different plants from with different root depths and also including shrubs. So that uh, this is mostly ground cover, uh, but there might be some shrubs in here that are still too small, still small, and you're not seeing them. Okay, so here's a slope. Uh, you can see that it's been prepared um, with the steps and the infrastructure. Um, and what is uh, uh, recommended and works well for our gardens whenever we've installed a garden on a slope is that people peg down burlap. So the, uh, the image on the right, you can see the burlap is pegged down and then the seeds, it's seeded into the burlap. That will protect the plants, the seedlings will come up through that burlap. Um, you've got to peg it down well. Uh, and it takes a couple of years for this to establish. You've got to keep it watered as well. Uh, this is called hydro seeding. So, um, you know, so how, how the heck do you seed that large slope? You hydro seed it, you hire a company uh, if it's really big to hydro seed the slope. And this one, um, is uh, the University of Virginia. They did this amazing job with the slope that surrounded their field. Uh, another example is a group in Calgary uh, uh, extended, they dug up uh, sod patches from their actual native prairie in Alberta and, and uh, took the sod patches to a large sloped area. And I don't have a slide to show you, uh, they had a hundred volunteers do this, flip the sod patches um, so that the roots would establish and just uh, planted those chunks of sod patches from the actual native prairie into a very large sweep, slope, sweeping slope area. And after three or four years now, it's absolutely beautiful. It established beautifully and they've now got um, an authentic native prairie uh, 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 in the city of Calgary on this big, large slope. And so companion planting works well. Um, you want to, first of all, of course, you want to eradicate your weeds, any weeds that are there that aren't going to crowd out your plants. Um, choose companions with similar growth rates to keep vigorous plants from acting uh, from pushing out your less vigorous plant. So if you've got uh, milkweed, common milkweed, for example, put them next to heath aster. Uh, uh, and uh, if you've got common, I would avoid common goldenrod, which tends to overcome everything. Um, the yarrow, white yarrow, for example, will spread very quickly. Put that next to your common milkweed <laughs> and your heath aster, and the three of them will duke it out. Um, put your more delicate, less aggressive plants uh, in their own section. Uh, slope damp drainage, you can see at the top, uh, is, uh, the, the, uh, those plants get the most wind as you go down the slope. Uh, there is less water, the groundwater is uh, sinks deeper. Um, and the water available to those plants is anything that's filtering down from above, but um, the roots, and they tend to be deeply rooted, trying to reach that underground water table. Uh, and then the water ends up accumulating at the bottom, and those plants uh, are the ones that will, that need the most water, uh, that benefit from more water. They, that's where your runoff uh, ends up down at the lower part of the slope. So you plan your, uh, choose your plants accordingly. The ones that need more water go with the slope, the, the, the back, the toe of the slope uh, at the very bottom. The ones that need less water that are more drought tolerant are mid slope. And the ones that are wind hardy are the ones at the top. And so if you use a mix of trees, shrubs, and perennials, you end up having a good uh, mix of roots that are gonna hold your soil and, um, and make good use of the water, available water. Don't till the soil on slopes uh, that will promote erosion. 
Okay, so here's uh, uh, the advice in mulching, about a three inch layer, not deeper, uh, to reduce runoff, okay. And you want to um, try and put some rocks in to divert the water uh, from uh, just channeling things downhill while those plant roots are established. And you can see planting trees on a slope, this cutaway shows the root of the tree extends uphill it's much shorter on its downhill move. So it's that uphill uphill reaching roots that really hold the tree to the slope. Now keep that in mind when you're planting trees on a slope. And if you can cut into the, it's called a cut and fill, cut into the, the slope and then build a bilm, berm downhill so that there's, um, there's a flatter area for the tree to establish that will help the tree uh, do well on the slope. Uh, for maintaining gardens on slopes, um, keep the top um, two and a half centimeters or so, or, or okay, uh, of the soil moist. That means up to your first knuckle when you stick your finger in the soil. Okay, and after that, uh, you do that for the first um, a half the summer after you plant it in the spring. Uh, water once a week until they're established for a couple of seasons. And then after that, they should thrive with your average Ontario rainfall. Uh, <clears throat> mulch um, every couple of years. Uh, well, I would say I mulch with compost. Uh, don't uh, I cut the soil. If I, if I cut down the tops of the plants, I leave them there. Uh, and I use my mulch. I use uh, a fly leaf mold as one of the best mulches you could use. Okay, different slope materials. Um, these are uh, shrubs. So fragrant sumac, snowberry, uh, calm St. John's wort, uh, the wild bergamot is great for slopes, a northern bush honey honeysuckle, smooth wild rose. Those are just some of the plants. Different gardening styles for slopes. You can have a more formal uh, structured pathway on the left and it goes to sort of like a, a wilder look in the center and uh, on the right is a, more of a meadow look. So gardening on sand, gravel, and rock. And this uh, includes alvars and gravel gardens is always interesting. So this is the look of an alvar. We have one uh, in the Peterborough area called the Card and the Alvar absolutely beautiful, it's full of prairie smoke, which is one of my favorite plants, uh, very shallow soils, uh, very well draining. So outside the Gardner Museum, there is a um, uh, an alvar type garden, uh, it's called a crevice garden, where the crevices are built by laying the um, flat rocks on edge and filled with gravel and soil. Uh, very beautiful. Uh, and you can grow alpine plants. It's a book called The Halvars of Ontario uh, in the Great Lakes region. And in fact, the Great Lakes region, the northern, north shore of the Great Lakes in Ontario is one of, it's a rare alvar biome. It's one of the rarest in the world. We've protected. Um, so here on the high line of New York, there's a beautiful alvar garden that's been constructed. Um, you can see that low, or alpine type plants growing there. On the, the photo on the left is the uh, the look of the high line before it was anything done to it. So you can see it's a very gravelly and native plants were growing there. They've just flown in and colonized the area, which gave Pete Udolf, the uh, landscape designer, the idea of the types of plants that would thrive. And so this is the type of garden that was made. And here's a close up of the look of the plants in this Elvar garden. Great for stony, rocky soil. If, you're, if you've got a cottage on Manitoulin Island, this would be a great solution for your garden. So how do you do this? Okay, so you can grow the plants in sharp drainage. Um, it's very uh, hostile to weeds, as you can imagine. Our, generally, our, our weeds that fly in are non-native um, uh, and uh, they like rich soil. So they love our gardens. They don't like gravel gardens. So uh, choose a well-drained site, create a border that keeps the gravel, that retains the gravel, the gravel doesn't wash away. 
Uh, you want to use angular uh, or quartzite or rounded pea gravel so it remains loose. You don't want it to pack down. Okay, uh, order to three agent gravel. Um, and uh, what you're looking are alliums. Uh, you're looking at a sort of selection of alliums and coneflowers and a bunch of grasses in here. Uh, Rattlesnake master. Okay. So establishing plants, so uh, you've got to dig a hole in the gravel so it gets uh, the bottom of the hole reaches the actual soil um, and the top of the plant is flush with the top of the gravel. You want the bottom of the roots of the root ball of a plant that you're planning to touch the soil. Uh, it won't grow roots out to the sides. It will extend its roots down deep into the soil and that whole top part that's gravelly will not be uh, an area where the roots are. And then you have to water like crazy while the plants are establishing their roots. Uh, make sure that the water goes down deeply where the soil, actual soil is. So here's the look of a layout of a gravel garden. Okay, and this is what a mature gravel garden will look like. Uh, lupins love gravel gardens, by the way, if you're a fan of lupins. Okay, another gravel garden look. And so these are very low maintenance, very drought tolerant, uh, beautiful plants. Um, if the paths are there naturally, they tend to be quite uh, organic looking and informal. Um, here they are, more gravel gardens. Uh, there's some moss flocks in there to add a pop of color. Okay. And this uh, is a gravel garden. It includes the um, woolly thyme, which is not an Ontario native plant, but it works very well in a gravel garden. Okay. So here are some plants that go well in gravel gardens. I've got to speed through, guys. Okay. Sweet fern is great. Nobody, not too many people know about sweet fern. So this um, is wonderful for a gravelly bank. And um, along a pool is another good place for a gravel garden. Uh, the different native grasses. Cytos grama is a favorite of mine. Uh, prairie drop seed, not native, but often used. It's very ornamental. Little blue stem uh, and June grass. Okay, the different um, uh, drought tolerant plants that do well in gravel. Wild columbine, of course, will do well in part shade. Pussy toes is a ground cover. Uh, white yarrow will, uh, will thrive in gravel. And harebell is a wonderful gravel uh, slope ground cover. It's a very delicate plant, but um, makes a beautiful ground cover. Sky blue aster and showy goldenrod. They, all of these look very nice together. Uh, here's your shrubs. Uh, we talked about sweet fern, nana bark, and uh, uh, New Jersey tea are good combinations in gravel gardens, particularly bearberry and alpine rock plants. Lead plant is another good gravel garden plant. These are all grow well in dry prairies. So the last item is salt. Um, this is my boulevard garden. You can see it's covered with salty snow. Uh, it's on a road that's fairly well-traveled. Salt gets sprayed onto it. Sidewalks are heavily salted. Uh, the salt runs down into the garden. Okay, that's the way it looks in the winter. Here it is in the summer. Okay, uh, plants are, have been chosen for their salt tolerance. Uh, they are not harmed at all by that salt. Okay, so that's the trick. Choose plants that are salt tolerant that have adapted themselves over the millennia to withstand the rigors of salt. And salt damages the soil terribly. Uh, it leaches into the root zone. It reduces the soil's ability to retain plant nutrients and water. It breaks down the soil structure. Uh, salt tolerant plants can accommodate all of those challenges and still thrive. Okay, so this is the thing about salt. So what you can do to reduce salt damage is flush the soil. Um, heavy spring rains, when we are usually, uh, we're fortunate enough to get lots of rain in the springtime. That can flush the icing salt beyond the root zone. That means below the root zone. Okay, it doesn't flush it out of the soil. It just goes deeper and then it filters away deeply, deep 
into Lake Ontario in terms of our part, okay? Uh, I'm not a big fan of road salt, as you can tell. In a dry spring, um, that's not going to happen. So you're going to need to flush the soil by rinsing the plants and flushing the soil with water. Get a hose and water, water, water that salt away. If you've got any plants that you can see burned leaves, sensitive plants not doing well, um, they're not growing well, the leaves are uh, have edema, they're wilting, dig them up and move them, okay, where they'll be protected, they might recover. Amend your heavy soils. Uh, heavy soils will hold on to the salt longer than sandy soil, of course. Um, the water doesn't run through as readily. Compost will help, always help improve the texture of heavy soils. Uh, and like I said, use salt tolerant native plants. So there's a list of some salt tolerant perennial plants. Okay, these are the ones that I use in my garden and do, they do quite well. Okay, and again, this is on the handout. So uh, that's the end folks. And um, we provide uh, uh, um, habitat for native pollinating insects and native uh, fauna and fauna and flora all year round. Uh, sustainability is no longer about doing less harm. It's about doing more good. Um, so do more good. You can do more good. Support local biodiversity efforts. That means be good and join the efforts of uh, Oakville Green and Blooming Boulevards. Uh, both of our organizations are working hard uh, to support biodiversity. You grow a native plant garden or help somebody else grow a native plant garden, take a workshop, um, well, just like you're doing today, uh, volunteer somewhere. Your help is needed and it matters. And uh, your any type of monetary contribution is always appreciated. Um, so we are Blooming Boulevards. We've been uh, uh, in, in uh operation for five years, uh, and we are pleased to say that we are going strong. So we have our garden applications open right now uh, until the 15th of May. Unfortunately, we can only offer our free plants, 50 free plants for those who apply for Boulevard Gardens to Mississauga residents only uh, because of our funding. Uh, but we have a big plant sale in June. Look for our, uh, our ads on Facebook, on our Facebook site, and in our newsletter, um, and details on our website, bloomingboulevards.org. So we have upcoming webinars coming up, uh, all hosted by Blooming Boulevards, uh, one on February 10th, Low Maintenance Boulevard Gardens. On March 9th is Design Your Own Pollinator Garden and our workshops stretch out all over, all through the summer, all through spring and summer and fall uh, until the end of October. Okay, so that is it. Uh, our workshop handouts for today are at www.bloomingboulevards.org forward slash services dash seven. And that's the end. I'll stop my share and I am happy to answer any questions that people might have. Yes. So um, you can all now unmute yourselves if you need to. Please be mindful of other people speaking. And we do have a few questions throughout the chat that have been asked. Um, so I, I believe. Yeah. So if you do, you have access to that? Do you or. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, so do you want to read out the questions and I sure. will just answer? Sure. So first we had a comment. So, hi, I would love to see a uh, presentation on wet sites, which I have plenty of. Thanks, says Karen. <laughs> so that'll, that'll be next. I have to that'll, put a that'll come up presentation next. on wet sites. <laughs> yes, for, perfect. Uh, Naomi has also added a very important point here. So she says that... Um, Harvesting peat is very damaging to the environment and this fragile ecosystem. So, and it releases a lot of CO2 into the environment. So please don't use peat if you can avoid it. And that is really important. I think it, uh, it's something that's uh, near and dear to us. We have to preserve some of those wetland environments, especially. Yeah. You no, know, it'd be interesting to have a panel on, on the use of um, peat and quar and other 
um, growing media, you know, what, what to get people's opinions. It's nice because there is a debate. And both sides have um, relevant, you know, have valid points. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Jen asks, what plants work best under a black walnut? I have some lists of juggalone tr tolerant, but I'm wondering which work best. Thank you. And I think oh. this question was asked right before the slide came up. But yeah, do you want to elaborate? Oh, that 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 will be on the handout. So go to the handouts and you'll see. Okay. Um. So Marlene says a project here used spun aspen and biodegradable pegs on slope that will all be composted in eighteen months. So that was a comment on the uh, use of you know some of the the new alternatives to slope planting. Yes. Okay. Uh, Anelia asked, have you tried the Chelsea chop pruning method on any of the taller native plants? Yes. Um, yeah, that, that's not really this topic, but it does have to do with garden design. And um, it was developed as, you know, as part of the Chelsea flower show. This is something that people with um, uh, 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 an eye to their the ornamental aspect of their gardens are very interested in. But for our boulevards, we have a height by law that means that um, the gardens, that the plants can't be over a meter tall or your bylaw officer can come and get you in trouble. Um, and so the, uh, we advocate the Chelsea, Chelsea Chop in the conditions, in a practical condition to meet a boulevard regulation. But what it does is it delays the blooming yeah. of that plant. So for an ornamental garden, um, it's nice. Uh, people say, well, Chelsea chop part of your plant, say, for example, a New England aster, is can get very tall, five yeah. feet. Okay. If you Chelsea chop that blooming, uh, uh, that New England uh, aster, it will bloom a week or two later, okay? And it will only be maybe three feet high, okay? So um, what happens to the insects? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the insects need the New England aster to bloom at the time that it's supposed to bloom. If it's delayed, and if you do this to all your plants so that they stay small, those insects will not have the access to the plants and they're, they're programmed to need those plants. Um, you think about the monarchs and their migration schedule. And if you chop your golden rods so that that delays their blooming, you've cut out their food at a very critical time when they're needing it to, um, to, to, to gather their fitness uh, for their long fly flight north uh, south. So those are things that yeah, yeah, totally like from ecological perspective, but when needed, it just occurred to me when you were speaking about the container gardening yes. um, or again, like front, front yard or boulevard gardening. And that's my case with some Joe pie wheat and, and some yellow cone flowers. Yeah. But unless you really need to keep them small, yeah, from ecological perspective, we're kind of going against nature so it cannot be ideal but if we need to keep them acceptable let's let's put it that way yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what, what i would do if you need a short plant i would actually choose a short yeah. species rather than chelsea chop a tall one yeah that would be the, thank the ideal <laughs> thank you yeah <laughs> Okay, um, and then we had a question from Jen. Uh, can I use black walnut leaves for compost, not for tomatoes, et cetera, but for the native garden? Well, I, you, it would be okay to use them for compost. Now I'm gonna get myself in trouble here because um, you have to make sure that, that you're using them for compost that's being applied to your juggling dependent, you know, uh, tolerant plants. Um, if it goes into, uh, if you're moving it around your garden, make sure that, uh, because that juggling is gonna last in the soil for a long time. Um, make sure that you're always going to plant juggling tolerant plants in those areas. 